They're still there. The crickets are still there. I can't believe it. Interrupting the current neo-coronial cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed, this is Cricket 2 Busting Episode BTW389. Perpetual optimism, folks. Perpetual. Behind the woodshed. I think you can do it. A couple of you can. I think you can do it. It's all it's going to really take. I always find it interesting to get involved and help people. You finally start coming to the point about how you've been harmed with this coronavirus. You find out it really isn't so simple to find out how, how you've been harmed. Because a lot of you were uh, sh sharp enough to stay away from all that nonsense to begin with. However, we still have a big problem. And it's going to take somebody stepping up correctly. And I want to just point out, I think that Ohio case, I haven't really looked at it more, hopefully broke the intelligence dam of what can happen relative to how you challenge this whole thing. It's been essentially what I was suggesting this entire time. And what they did is they found uh, the diagnostic panel to say, essentially there's no base foundational isolates, genomic isolates, from a particular thing that is presumed to test for it, let alone prove it, as a cause for a disease. So you have a name, uh, flu symptoms, COVID without a causative communicable agent. You can't, that's not a communicable disease. I don't care if it's novel or not. And so we have the focus is the problem right here that we look at. And then we realize that, wait, that was what's supposed to be identified. When you find out you can't identify something, therefore the states could not identify anything and they have the duty to. If they have the duty to and they can't fulfill that duty and then they impose police power, they don't have actual authority. It's under collar of police power. I've told you before, they interfere with your property, which is extortion, or your rights, which is coercion. Those are felonies. And so this thing seemed to me early, early on to be pretty dealable, handleable. It's the art of the deal, folks. We're told it's reality TV. You're being game showed. In fact, that just came out in the recent uh, thing we're going to talk about here in a moment. Uh, we have the ability to step up, and the more people I talk about, I talk to with about this, the reflection from them now, and these are the people I talk with locally, they're starting to see this. This, as I've told you before, this COVID allowed us to untie the entire bindings on us. We get everything actually, and it's you can tie in. It's almost too much. You can tie ev almost everything that causes our problem today to everything you all complain about out there. It's really fascinating how they did this. And you can identify them by the same things. And I'll show you maybe, well, uh, I don't know, maybe I say maybe because I don't know what people really listen for or how long. My broadcasts are two hours, and they tie, the, they tie things together for two hours. So if you drop in on for 10 or 15 minutes, you're likely missing a lot, a ton, if you're not missing the whole thing. And so I appreciate that you're giving me the time, but it also requires that time. And it's not just to hear me talk. I'm asking you to listen to what I'm saying to go apply what I'm saying. And so this is a, this COVID thing is really a neat, neat opportunity. I'm partially excited and partially disappointed because you know, if I saw it again today in the, in the Twitter, someone says we got to rise up. The second time they take you down in the business, it's, it's over. Well, you should have stopped back. I said this thing was stoppable in March. Can't get a people to write, can't get anybody to write a simple, specific letter to start the, the process, to allow y'all uh, to end this. And in a big way, if you understand, depends on who you are and how you want to integrate things. It's all out there to get global, literally global. And so th this is a, you want to talk about conspiracies and theories? No, you can see it's all in the documents, who the players are, the game being played, that you're being played. And there was no ability in the law for that to happen. And so anybody that allowed it is derelict. These are not inconsequential consequences of those derelictions. There's your cause. There's your harm. And so it's not that hard to get at. And if my language has already got you kind of confused or not, or not keeping up, this is where they got us. This is, they're not, that shouldn't have been that hard to understand. And or over these years, should have been, I should have been getting emails. You, you don't speak too clear. Why? Here's, what you, here's where it says you should have said something else. No one says that to me. And so I have to go with what I know, I believe I know, and I can prove that I know. And I focus in, I've learned, tried to learn how to focus in laser-like on what we need. 
and not what we want. And right now, it's just to, just to grab a toho, just write a special, just get a specific letter. Why do I say specific? Because there's a proper way to approach this, and there's a proper way to attack where they failed. And they fail. I say they, the capital T, they. Whoever these agents of they are, it was universal what they failed in. It's all the same point. It's really actually pretty, that's what's exciting. I can listen, you can send me some things, I can listen to what you want to do, and we could go to your state law, and all the law, state laws I've looked at, whether I have to go find the point, because you're not quite understanding what I'm actually saying about looking for that one foundational place they violated, which is essentially to determine what the contagion or source of the infection was that they're claiming for the name COVID, or any other thing like this. Find that statute. When you find it, they all read pretty much the same. Now, all the states. And so I'm going to go through one today after a bit. I'm going to read another story, total different subject matter, because I want to get to it. It's just fascinating to me. haven't heard any more information about it. But we're going to get, I'm going to show you how you can identify the imposition of the foreigners into your state laws that have put there before you even get to the problem that they utilize to trigger off all this stuff. And if you just read a little bit, you could find it. And when you find it, then you realize how, how they did it, but also what to attack. And you do have to bring up, like I said, the black and white that establish the objective basis for how things are done. Otherwise, if you don't, even if you don't agree with what you see as far as the foundation, the establishment of government itself, right now that's the only basis we have to, to be objective. In other words, you can stand on a foundation that everybody else has sand for. And when the, when the wave of truth comes through, you're still standing there. And they get washed away is the reason why I say go to the black and white. It's not necessarily that some of it I even agree with, but it's the only objective basis we have, so that when you look into a thing, everybody looking in sees the same thing. Now, I suppose there'd be different opinions on that thing, and that's what you get these corrupt courts to do. You create an opinion that they get to put in. I've been suggesting you don't make an argument when you walk into a court on a self-evident proof of your harm relative to a violation of anyone or an official in this particular case. You don't walk in with an argument, and you don't create an argument. And so let me move into first, before I get back into that, to show you, you can see, if you will, sustainable development. You can see the encroachment of foreigners in your state already in the laws, and it's in the rules, actually, in this one state. I just ran across this this, this week, and I'm going to talk about it because it could be important for some of you that want to take a higher step into actually taking control of why the problem exists and to solve it. There's a higher level of, of engagement. In fact, I just ran across it because that's what we're going to, I'm attempting to get, have someone do for themselves. Because that remedy and that case allows it is one of the main points. But you can get very technical on how you can uh, apply what I've been saying and you can force the changes. I don't mean force in the concept of forcing like you do it un, unreasonably or without purpose, you establish how what they've done was a violence to the law and the purpose for which the, the, the things and the due process that was put into place that violated you. And you say, we're going to take this thing away. We're going to have you fix it so that this can't happen again to anybody. And the kind of things I'm talking about here are what we sued in 2013, where, as I told you, they put bills in, the legislature put bills in that were written by university law schools now, they must have thousands of uh, people that write this stuff, and then they go into legislation, but they put it in in bits and parts. The legislature, if they were honest to be looking for it, couldn't actually see the integration of this. Once all the bills of parts are passed, they build that, they build in behind the enactments what they needed to make rules to violate you. Now, I saw this early on, and that's what we sued in 2013. And so this gives me an insight of where I'm going to go after this moment here, well, I'm going to point out something very, very interesting. And those of you with patents understand about patent lands and this thing and the government, as I've been talking to you, the United States government or the state government's grants or their obligations and duties as reference, let's say, the United States taking over the lands that Mexico had but honoring the treaties of Hidalgo, they honored that. These are things in an international context that have to be done if there's going to be any legitimacy in any government. Uh, otherwise, you bring on a whole lot of woe onto yourself as a government. And so there is an, a reflection of what I've been telling you of the 
the propriety of standing on grants and relationships here in a story that happened way back in July, I think of the ninth or so. I'm just getting to it now. It, again, it's just a whole lot to see here. I don't know what the end, what this is going to what this is going to be doing generally to the to Oklahoma essentially, uh, but th this is a very big deal and it's really focuses can focus us in on what's important and where the Supreme Court opined uh, things should be. As I've told you, some of this stuff, I don't understand where the question is. It's written in black and white. You get into land law, you get into grants, you get into obligations and duties, you get into domestic or foreign treaties, and you understand that they're supposed to mean something, and they likely do. And like I point out to you, even the reservation in an, a regular international regulation, the United States identified the distinction of state federal, the establishment, and said they can't trespass the state's authority, that these are all sitting there too. These are all black and white. These are all current things that are going on that you can identify. For those of you that keep trying to figure out where your distinctions are, you can identify the government is speaking into its limits as well. In fact, this uh, COVID is speaking greatly to limits and how you identify how you limit police power. Because in this case, there is no test it happened to be no test for the very particular thing they presumed to be the cause, which can't happen underneath a police power. You don't invoke police power on a presumption. What did I use that word, that term that I, I've stated to you? Uh, demonstrable exigence. It's typically more sounding, you see it written as demonstrable exigency. Okay, it's out there. That's what invokes. It has to have a demonstrated circumstance with a harm that's going on by it. And so this is the basics that we're looking at to uh, that there is limitations in the government. They do pay attention that they haven't paid attention and you have been silent is why it's continuing to go on. Your silence is the victory of those that are imposing this. So you have to assert your rights and you have to continue to assert them. This next uh, story back in July was just impressive. And uh, it is that U.S. Supreme Court deems half of Oklahoma a Native American reservation. I haven't been able to go back and look at this. I've been really focused on trying to use help people use the COVID problem that the governments have, not you. You are just fig you're just being affected by it because you want you apparently like to complain about people that have no cause against you but like to harm you. So I don't know about that part, but for the people that are really feeling that they want to come back with this, we can point this part out that the Indian Native Americans uh were asserting, and this wasn't a Native American case, but it, they were assert, it was a criminal court case, it was asserting a jurisdictional challenge. And if you don't know about jurisdiction, you haven't been listening behind the woodshed long enough. And I talk about it all the time, and I talk about the importance of it. And here's a case that turns on that. There's a case that turns on the promises of the United States government, notwithstanding what we hear and our opinions about it didn't, didn't uphold certain things and that it hasn't. And that's the, maybe the truth, but there's a way to press against that and essentially, uh, hopefully, in most cases, ultimately prevail when the uh, stars line up just right, which is not justice, but it can show you in the future what's going on. The United States Supreme Court on Thursday, which is back in July or 9th or so, on Thursday, recognized that half of Oklahoma as Native American reservation land and overturned a tribe member's rape conviction because the location where the crime was committed would have been considered outside the reach of state criminal law. Okay, I want to rest that a little bit. Think about what that's saying. Think about everything I talk about, too, if you've listened to any time behind the woodshed and what I'm explaining to you all. This is a jurisdictional challenge that the state criminal laws didn't apply to a guy who actually got like a thousand year sentence. And I think it was for raping a four-year-old uh, four-year-old child. Okay, so think about that dynamic. Even a conviction was overturned. If we agree the first conviction by a jury, whether or not you might consider that of one of peers or not, was true, someone's going to be relieved of a thousand-year life sentence for doing a pretty heinous thing because of jurisdiction. Now, the important also, so that's important to understand about why you challenge up front jurisdiction. And I see lots of people doing motions to dismiss. I've advocated that you don't do that. Motions actually agree the court has jurisdiction. When you do a jurisdictional challenge, it's kind of an oxymoron. If it isn't absolutely an oxymoron to challenge jurisdiction, but move the court to 
to decide for you. Uh, the motion, the, what you do is you do it prior to plea. You, you try to exhaust everything you know about before you enter a plea and before you file motions. It's a, essentially a collateral attack on the sufficiencies of the complaint, of any complaint. And I use the term pre-plea remedies and avoidance. People will, may search that out. You may not find much on those. Those used to be available to be seen, but there's been an interesting sucking sound relative to these old, if you will, common law, these old procedural rights that people have. You'll see them in some states rec notice as, as a, as a set-aside. And uh, they may be deemed to be a motion, but they're actually not. And anyway, so you set aside something that doesn't, isn't valid before a court. And the court's not taking jurisdiction at that point. It's looking to see whether or not that's true, that it does not have jurisdiction. It's similar to the, and uh, you've heard, uh, heard me read, court, a federal court will go through the analysis of whether someone met the threshold, crossed the threshold, the door that they opened, did they cross that in order to get into the federal court? Is the same kind of an idea of a jurisdictional challenge before Anything happens in the case. And so you, a lot of people want to do them after the case, and that after, and they engage the, the court, and then they wonder why their cases don't work. I say you do the pre-plea remedy avoidance, and then you don't ever stop. Your first motions are to do the same thing to dismiss the case after you do a, a remedy and avoidance. It's almost identical arguments. They shift just a little bit better, uh, excuse me, a little bit different on how you address the very same things because you have to be someone who asserts your rights all the time. And a jurisdictional challenge can be asserted all the time and, and at any time. And so here it is. This case is, you're hearing a ton of stuff in this case, very fascinating to me. The justices ruled five to four in favor of a man named Jim C. McGirt and agreed that the site of the rape should be recognized as part of a reservation based on historic claim of Muskegee Nation beyond the jurisdiction of state authorities. The decision means that for the first time, much of eastern Oklahoma is legally considered reservation land. More than 1.8 million people live in the, in the land at issue, including roughly 400,000 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Oklahoma's second largest city. Conservative Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote the ruling, joining the court's four liberals in the majority. Gorsuch referenced the complex historical record that started with the forced relocation by the United States government of Native Americans, including the Crete Nation, to Oklahoma in a traumatic 19th century event known as the Trail of Tears. At this time, the United States government pledged that the new land would be theirs in perpetuity. Let me interject a bit here and not to turn off the importance of this, this march of people uh, to a removing them from their lands into a specific land, that you see in perpetuity, I want to remind those that have understood about patents or don't know and want to understand about them, go look on your patent, not the one that people tell you to invent, forget that. Go to the land office of your of your state, If that's even if that's the state land office, look for the originating disposal document, which is usually called a patent. In a state disposal, it's called, I think, a certificate. And so you look for that initial document that was already created in the record, and you go read for the term forever near the bottom, near the end. Your rights in this four corners of this document is described within the four corners is forever to the heirs and assigns. Forever is this word perpetuity. Okay, so these, these grants are all the same. And I found it interesting here they use the word pledge and I hadn't read the court case here, but the government pledged. Pledge is not a very, um, in my mind, and we read international law, not a very high level of thing. It's an okay thing, but it's not necessarily so guaranteed. I would not actually move on a pledge by anybody if I was my life depended on it. However, they make the they make this idea here, this uh, potential of a government pledge being actually more. It's going to have to. It's not. It's not, they call it a pledge, but in this case, it actually functions as more of that grant issue. So an interesting little, for those that may be paying attention to the nuances, the word pledge here is very interestingly used, and it might just be the editorial, but it would be interesting if they used it in the case. Today, quote, today we are asked whether the land these treaties promised remains an Indian reservation for the purpose of criminal federal criminal law. Because Congress has not said otherwise, we hold the government to its word. Gorsuch wrote, 
Gorsuch rejected the state's argument, argument which said would require turning the, quote, blind eye to the government's past promises. I was shocked to even read that. This is the type of uh, attorneyship, bar member nonsense, uh, criminality that sits in the government's, your own attorney general's office in your states, likely why you're not, you're seeing the type of world you're, you're, you're seeing at this point. Uh, turn a blind eye to the government's past promises is not only of something they cannot say relative to the sovereign power of the federal government, but it violates their enabling act to enforce, be subject to those disposals. Now, I don't know if you even hear all this stuff, but this is what I've talked to you about over and over and year after year. How to get your land, how to get your property, how to identify that thing, those things that are not just yours, but the obligation of the government to protect. And you have a state here that you see now that the attorneys of the state are criminals, trust breachers. <laughs> They're in offices of the government that are insisting that the, even the state doesn't honor its own obligations in the creation of it when it was created. And so there's a bunch in this in these little paragraphs here about this story on top of the, just think about this, half of Oklahoma is still an Indian reservation. I don't even know how they're going to deal with this, actually, but it's okay. We'll watch it. We'll watch it unfold. In a joint statement, the state, the Creek Nation, and the other four of what is known as the five tribes of Oklahoma said that they were making substantial progress toward an agreement on shared jurisdiction that they would present to the federal government. The other tribes are the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminole. Quote, the nations in the state are committed to implementing a framework of shared jurisdiction that will preserve sovereign interests and rights to self-government while affirming jurisdictional understandings, procedures, laws, and regulations that support public safety, our economy, and private property rights, the statement said. What a mouthful in there. But you understand this affirming jurisdictional understandings. This word jurisdiction is a critical abstraction to understand that I've been pointing out all the time. Whether or not we ever get this discussed in a court that's been controlled by bar members that would actually throw out the courts, the state's obligations under its enabling act, I, I don't know. But this is the other problem that we have when no one comes forward and there isn't a flood of people coming forward on the point about this, these things keep going along and keep violating people until you find out life has gone on. 1.8 million people were living, I would wonder if whether or not wrongly, on someone else's land. And that land disposal is important. Okay, so this is very important to keep following because it keeps tracking back and down if the government, your local state government, will say they don't have an obligation to dispose of the federal government in violation of their enabling act, what do you think they're doing to your property rights? Why do you think you're paying property tax? And why do you think most of you, whether you try it or not, whether you think to try it, are having trouble if you do the wrong statements or make the wrong claims, how easy it is for them to get by with it? Okay, so this is, we're seeing the crux of our problem. All of everybody. I keep wanting to say something Russell Means said, but I'm not going to quite say it. Maybe I'll forget about it when I get there. But unless, because it doesn't quite fit, but it fits completely. You, uh, about the reservation, the res. Unless changes are made, tribe members who live within the boundaries would now become exempt from certain state obligations, such as paying state taxes, while certain Native Americans found guilty in state courts would be able to challenge their convictions on jurisdictional grounds. The tribe also may obtain more power to regulate alcohol sales and expand casino gambling. Now, my problem on this, and I'm, I may be out of turn to say so, what I've seen in some of these uh, these tribes that get casinos, it almost becomes a mafia. It's just like where money follows, the people don't really get the benefit. Well, there's some benefit, but it's ultimately a problem. Um, when we were dealing uh, with the Klamath Indians on relative to the dams and things, and the, Ind and the Indian tribe itself... They knew the power, the, the need of the dams. They knew the need allowed for the fish that they needed. The tribal people knew that, but the so-called, uh, the corporate controlled boards were totally environmentally subverted. 
and so you see a you see a problem between like anything and the government of the people and the people may be at complete odds and i'm not going to say that's generally um, i'm not going to say that's everywhere but it it certainly has been my experience. So when I see the power to regulate alcohol sales and, and expand casino gambling, I'm not so sure that, that alcohol or casino gambling is anything that a, a people need in their lives. And that, I guess that's a my, my impression, private impression on that. But I just haven't seen that that's been helping the people much of anything. So I'm a little bit leery. I am just can't be more thrilled about the fact that we're looking at land law. We're looking at objective grants we're looking at the obligations of governments on their own word if you will it's in documents uh, and this is being upheld here the ruling voided mcgirt's sentence of a thousand years in prison but he could face a new trial in federal court rather than state court what i find interesting about that is that the state's involved but they're talking about federal law the question was brought to them under federal criminal law not under state law so i'm not sure about this part of it and that's where i started to fall off a little bit of the understanding here but it didn't matter the rule is that the reservation is going to be is existent as it was granted, um, allowed, if you will, but granted by the disposed to the Indians in their movement you know, through the Trail of Tears to this land. Interestingly, too, I always think about this. They were moved, it kept in, the tribes were moved, the Indian, the Native Indians were moved always to places that seemed like it was desolate. And then every time there was there, there was mineral value. There was oil now. I mean, all this kind of value sat there. Now, that wasn't, I don't think, if I remember right, and I could be, well, I could be corrected. You can send me a, a, an email, mark on the beast at protonmail.com to correct me, but I don't think that, and the United States government always reserves the minerals. So the surface use is what usually the native Indians got. So they wouldn't have necessarily got it, but they always got moved to some place that was actually found to have minerals. And uh, that, uh, that seemed to me, I don't know if that was done on purpose, I don't think it was because most minerals weren't known at the time, but it seemed to be an, always an encroachment. If you understand things like Menard run oil in, and and the split estate uh, concept that a mineral instrument always has rights, then you see that the land, the surface land can be entered for the mineral. And then there's a whole process about the rules about that. But anyway, you don't get to get too far afield. Uh, we're talking about, in this case, land law disposals and the honor that is supposed to be extended and is now extended and the, and the Supreme Court currently just reinforced all of this that I've really been talking about. What, what got me involved really in the uh, Jefferson Mining District, the, uh, the mining law, and understanding it more as a land disposal law than just going and, and digging minerals out of the ground. There's that too. That's the that's what the intent was for the to make this for from the government was that they would focus miners who are the most capable to go and use the land of uh, known for minerals the most effect efficiently. That was the plan, and that's usually how it works somewhat. It doesn't anyway. So looking at it from land grant disposal law, and then the disposal being in every state in the enabling act of every state brought this con this um. This subject matter, way high, way high in the in the law. I talk about the law of the land is what I keep telling you. This is the real thing here. This is the law of the land, not the law in Article, what, Section, Article 6 of the Federal Constitution. No, this is the law of the literal land. It has powerful, long international roots. And I don't know why we've abandoned them, but we have. And so I've been here for years and decade or so, at least voice in voice to explain a lot of this us uh, under us law going on here tribe members who commit to tribes and travel and cannot be prosecuted in state courts instead are subject to federal prosecution which sometimes can be beneficial to defendants reservations were established beginning in the 19th century after us authorities expelled native americans from their traditional lands mcgirt 71 has served more than two decades in prison after being convicted in 1997 in wagner county in eastern Oklahoma for rape, lewd molestation, and forcibly sodomy of a four-year-old girl, McGirt, who did not contest his guilt in the case before the justices had appealed a 2019 ruling by a state appeals court in favor of Oklahoma. McGirt is a member of the Seminole Nation. The crime occurred on land historically claimed by the Crete Nation. At issue was whether the Muskegee Creek National Nation Territory, where the crime was committed, should be considered a Native American reservation, or whether Congress eliminated that status around the time of Oklahoma became a state 
in 1907. Uh, this is very important to follow. Uh, folks, all you folks listening to me who uh, live in the United States of America, this is really some prime information that you really need to understand. And my thought is, and I see this a lot, if you don't understand the basis of this, you'll have no real appreciation of what we're really hearing about. And therefore, you won't have the real good solid foundation in the rock, in the land, about how we move up and how the veneers of government don't and can't touch certain things and how you then use those out of jurisdiction, beyond the jurisdiction things, in order to defend yourself and you get back to your rights that you were given. You don't, see, I told you, when you start understanding they make fictions, you just, you don't argue those, you just stick those as a knowledge in your back pocket and you speak past those. You make a status that doesn't even engage it. Oh, the law can look at you as a, as a person, like a, a generic patentee, but they're going to have to look at you as your status as a patentee. The word person falls away. It's just a generic way for the legal words, the black and white, to deal in generic capacities relative to specific subject matter. And so there's a couple ways to look at this. But we don't talk about not being a person. We talk about being the status that empowers our position, a patentee. And then we, if you're, if you're knowing what you're doing, you go find all the statutes that says, no, the government can't touch this. Can't touch this, folks. Then they write a song about that. This is important. This is how you find out there's a hierarchy in this place relative to land disposal. And when uh, Oklahoma became a state, the challenge was it became a state it extinguished reservation. Apparently that wasn't the case because that's a, we heard that come out that there is no such thing. This is just like a treaty, folks. And remember, there's quite like three treaties or so, four types of treaties. We normally hear about the international treaty, but there's a domestic treaty as well. How do you know that? The legislature makes a law and the president assigns it. And then upon the enactment, Someone comes and claims underneath that, by that law, not underneath it necessarily, or pursuant to it, I guess is a better word, and its intention, purpose, and all that, that, that the legislature mandated, that enacted to have happen, and the executive, once that law is fulfilled, sub-signs on the patent to give the double witness of the c disposal. That is considered a domestic treaty. And if you don't really grab that part, you're missing a big, powerful condition. And it's not to say how powerful you are. It's just a status relative to a, a condition, I mean, um, a subject matter called land. Once you see how this works together, for me, I look around and I start finding all this stuff where the government came floating in over the top of what the men, if you will, and no, no, no disrespect to women here, but the men uh, made established to their benefit as a trust. Now, the government itself. And so we're, again, this is a kind of exciting to me to just go through. There's a lot to say to expose to people. And to me, I'm not burdened by a lot of the terminology that I used to hear like in the 90s. You, you, you know, what we say, freemen on the land, all that. No, no, okay, that's, okay, that might be. But no, no legal, no legal mind, no legal jurist, the bar associate member is going to look at that because they don't have jurisdiction to either. However, if you have a status within a subject matter, that cannot be disregarded. And if it is, you have the, vi the violation. And if it is on substantial property or rights, you literally you can identify the felonies by commission or omission that I keep telling you for years and years that are sitting there to protect you or at least make the record of. Remember, the earlier I read that this in this article, they went by the record, the historic record. I hope you didn't, I hope that, literally, I hope something in your mind said, oh, there's the word record again. When I've come to you uh, behind a woodshed and said, you need to make the proper record, this is not a joke. This is exactly how this thing works, or to a large part. Whether or not that record is actually looked at, that's a different question. But the Supreme Court just advised that they looked at a historic record, something in writing, not made up, not an opinion, official records, it's all there. And it has to be worked out through, and if you look at the patent for your lands, it's a chain of possession, a chain of title. Uh, the chain of evidence is also you're looking at there. And it ties you and evidentiarily to the original, through assignment, by to the original disposal the government, the federal government likely did, and some of the northern, uh, north, central 
northern states, the states did it. And interestingly, one of those states, if I can remember right, and I was shown by some uh, an emailer that they used the use they used the word allodial in their constitution. So that even changed because uh, I was saying they didn't exist, but in the United States, but now I do know that they do. So they recognize these very, uh, I can't say high, but they're very paramount tied to paramount evidences of possession. That's what they are. They're not they're not property in the sense that they're the property. They're evidence of the possession, and it's the ultimate evidence ultimate evidence it's not it's not diminished and can't be diminished here you go again the historic record was relied on to come to this decision oklahoma had argued that the state crete nation never had a reservation but even if one existed the state and the uh, president donald trump's administration argued it long ago was eliminated by congress you know when i read that i said boy this guy trump wow he doesn't even recognize the historic record. He doesn't recognize land. He doesn't recognize law. He's, a, he's supposed to be a, re, a real estate mogul. See, this is showing you there's another disconnect between legal and what law the land does. Now, I know that that's his administration. He's being blamed for it. But still, you'd think if he was given a notice this was going on, he'd have an input. And it'd be more than mortgages. It'd be more than the other veneer. There's another veneer on top of that, the, the, the paper world, the financial world. And so, I don't, it's just fascinating here. A uh, reservation is, uh, is land managed by a tribe under a Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs and generally exempt from state jurisdiction. I'm going to throw in a little bit more of an opinion in looking at how the tribes have to work through the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs. That seems to be a big problem as well. Uh, I'm talking about the people. The people have a problem. And this is a tr another trust sitting inside uh, in there and i think and i don't know i've not really dealt with many uh, native indian americans uh, native americans in tri uh, in a tribal question a couple but not very often and uh, normally the condition was that we didn't we couldn't invoke the jurisdiction of the tribe when the facts were actually laid out so i didn't really get to look a little any more any more deeply but the people are not being benefited and then they have the representatives no different like the corporate like the boards they're not really being represented. There's lots of words that they are, but in fact, maybe I've noticed that they're not. And so this shows you a different level of, uh, you may have so-called sovereignty, but it's, uh, and it's over a territory, but it's managed through another trust. No different, and it's a sub, sub trust of a major, of the ba bigger trust called the United States government. So the story here, this report, fascinating. There's a ton of real law in this that is can be pulled out if you know to read for it and like i said it's partly exciting to see a recent discussion actually speak to all this foundational stuff now i didn't notice uh, not many people talked about this i don't can you imagine how come this didn't make front page news and if it did maybe i don't get if i don't get the news maybe it did maybe i shouldn't speak so fast but this should have been really big big news for a long time and not just that it's half a, they call, you know, generally half of, of Oklahoma is a reservation, but that there was actual law of the land being honored here. And even as an opinion of the Supreme Court, like I said, why should that even be a question that it's there? But in fact, it was. And in fact, it did follow essentially uh, in general while reading through this. What I've told you is where your power is in that law of the land, the land itself one avenue of getting there it's where you come from the disposals of how you why i tell you don't do your right to drive look it over at the road law and the disposal to uh, public use underneath the 1866 load law in article in excuse, section uh, eight where the construction of the road is hereby granted and there was no other condition and that's how all the roads in the west were made it wasn't my taxes. It was a bunch of producers going out there and looking to see if they could produce for the for themselves, but for the nation, what the Congress intended that to be. For miners, you don't get the land but for to develop and extract minerals, and then particularized minerals depending on the particularized law. And so it's all organized. It's all set up. The only problem is the adulteration that goes on, the abuse that goes on with government agencies and a bunch of ignorant Americans that don't know how to fight back if it's a fight. As I've said, these regulations come down 
Uh, Menard Run uh, oil case, in, I think in the 80s, and that whole set of cases, just absolutely instructive on what's supposed to go on. Uh, for those of you that are interested, and I'm not sure, I guess Jefferson Mining District has in their case uh, section, maybe I think on the right-hand side, I can't remember now, go down, roll ta or scroll down a little ways, and you'll see the Mining Rights Center or something. Go find the case law. We use Menard Run as a, I put it, we put it up on the website to, to read it. You see split estates, you see what the relative combina, uh, relationship is. You see how this place is wired from the ground, literally the ground up and what's supposed to happen. Not like what we see now where we have foreigners jumping in and putting in alternatives all over your life uh, that you have, don't speak out against and run the dialectic against you and they run the system against you and they impose and put a bunch of cancerous cells inside your system and you still remain silent and then they start metastasizing as they've been growing for years when something like COVID comes along. And yet we have examples here, like back in the middle of this whole thing, there is a foundational thing, even to my dismay a bit, that a pledge, if unless this is an editorial word, the pledge was placed up very high. This wasn't as a is diminished as I've seen a so-called pledge that can be. They really, if that word pledge is important, so it doesn't matter. The Native American Indians were reserved land for their for their life and for in perpetuity, and that was just honored. So 1.8 million of you living in uh, in Oklahoma that are not of the Indian tribes are going to find yourself in an interesting position. And I'm not quite really sure how they're going to work all that out, but it's going to, it should be very interesting. And this may foretell some other conditions that are gone through the United States government in the, in very like manner for the Native Americans. And I don't know more to think about. It's whether you uphold the land law or you don't. And if you don't, watch out. I just tell you, just watch out in these times of nuts and insanity, of no law, of adjunct policy of cancerous uh, impositions by the bar of their ru of rules and promulgations, advice to the agencies of government to eat away at your substance, you, you better start looking at some foundational point in order to start from. Your foundation has to be the rock. It can't be sand. I see so many people wanting to make it sand, and I don't know why, but I try to advise against it, but it keeps coming up. So I'm here again to tell you, here's the law of the land. It was from my understanding of the historic record, preserved by the by the Supreme Court, and it's going to have a dynamic because no one paid attention or allowed it to pay attention. There wasn't a unified protection of property rights. You watch how now this went hundreds of years or so, and how messed up now it becomes because we didn't hold to that law of the land and make sure it was held. And so this is, I'm, and if you think this is messed up, you watch what COVID does. You just watch. As we now move into that, I want to bring up some things to point out this cancerous imposition. I will blame the Bar Association because I don't know of anyone else that has an integrated system globally that is also the advisor to every official you know and as a threat from what I can tell. When they say you better not go there, the official will not. And the official just comes and goes in the United States every four or five years, whatever, six years. They're not here for very long, so they're easy to keep in tow. So the, the ones that are writing the law is not your local politician. And so they, that source comes from somewhere. We found out it's the Bar Association by their members, by their lobbyists, or by the, more importantly, for environmental things we found and things of the Agenda 21, which they don't, they'll don't they deny exists, or the sustainable development they promote is coming out of the law schools. It's coming out of the university system. And the university system set up is a big problem. It's a big cancer. And so all this stuff sits there. You can deny it. You can call it whatever you want. You can turn your head. You can say the government doesn't work. All these people are working to eat out your substance every day. They are really adherents to their religious belief. I just, you just, you just don't under, I guess people don't understand this, uh, how, how devoted these people are. But here's what happens underneath this, this other thing where no one wants to really listen behind a woodshed or even know on their own or even search out when the problem gets this bad. They're arresting her for not having a mask. Mother who claimed she had asthma is tasered by police at a football game. 
And I'm getting this list from Blacklisted News because this listing had something in it that the actual original article I couldn't find on it. Could be my browsers, could be how I block them, I, I, I don't know. I don't get much. If it's an accessory to, to a website, I try to block all that up. And so uh, my experience on the Internet's not as free as I think most people might experience. So anyway, I found Blacklisted News. I want to thank Doug for reposting this so I could even see this. Because this became very important. Of all this story of, a, of the mother being tased, here's a video. You can watch the video. Got the link. You can get on the Internet and find it. A mom who watched the American football match in a sparsely crowded venue was angri angrily pleaded her innocence while being tasered by police with other parents saying the shocking incident happened because she was not wearing a mask. The woman who had, has been identified as Alicia Kitts was watching an eighth grade football game in a near empty outdoor school sports setting when she was filmed being approached by a policeman and forcibly removed from the venue in a disturbing altercation lasting several minutes. Here's the paragraph I want you to pay attention to. As shocking as all that is, I've told you there's an answer to it. And this policeman, we don't know, I guess, that even the people that were there didn't know if it was an actual policeman or not, or a security guard or whatever. Uh, here, she is thought to have kept her mask in her pocket, which people on school property are mandated to wear in Ohio under state and Centers for Disease Control Prevention CDC rules because she had asthma. Won't get any more in a sensational part of this or what didn't happen, or what I think ought to happen. Uh, here's that simple little letter coming out to take away whoever that, uh, that uniform, the costumed one, was trying to do. You stick up your little letter that you sent to your local official, uh, the, poli the, po the health department, to ask how they made the determination on a presumption and proved a presumption where the duty in the statute says you identify an infectious agent where there is no test type question demand, you put that into administrative review by that letter and your return receipt requested evidence in your pocket because now you need these traveling papers. And when they come after you, you put that in their face and say, you don't, this is still under review whether I have to or not. And this will cause you to become into a felonious assault if you do any of this and more. And you at least have that much in your mouth and you hand them a copy whoever this is, instead of saying, you can't do this, you don't have right, it's none of that, you can't listen to these people. But this is the, I wanted to point out, Ohio under, this is in Ohio under Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention Rules. What did I say about jurisdiction, folks? This whole question, the man I tell you to make, is a juris, ultimately a jurisdictional question. Is the state, through its delegated officer, have jurisdiction over subject matter it has not yet proven to be the fact, the demonstrable, the demonstrated exigency. Exigence, I say. Not a general exigency, but the exigence itself, the one that you've identified. Before the police power allows this brute to do whatever they have, the latter of which at least is something you stick in their face to take away their good faith, that there was something going on. Not that because you, you, you have a special, special silver bullet piece of paper, this is the process that you did, not just some card you made up. Because if you presented that in that regard, you're committing the fraud. And so, we, I want to get back to this Ohio under state and centers of disease control, jurisdiction, uh, uh, prevention, uh, CDC rules. Where does the federal have power in the state? How did the federal give, get power in the state? that they both are concurrent against this woman. Where, when we just heard, <laughs> and you have a state that was enabled into existence and Congress agreed and the president agreed and signed that's a domestic treaty enabling the state to exist with its powers not reserved to the federal government. Health being within the state of jurisdiction, how did the CDC get a say? And I found this interesting. This came up with that statement right as I'm doing some research on another thing we're working on. I'm trying to contribute to to get something moved forward. Hopefully we cross our fingers it's going to happen here finally. But this comes up and this came up and this was right in line with what I was, uh, you know, this you think, almost think providence here. All of a sudden comes out to point out in another state than what the one this I'm contributing to, the same condition is happening. This is not one-off what I was looking at in the other state. It happens here in Ohio, too. The CDC rules are 
upon every one of you. How? And so let me just go to a, a rule set in a state, and I want to read a couple of things. And I want to show you what I interpret to be the cancer seeds that were planted, have to be by the attorneys, into a rule set, a promulgation, to supposedly implement an intent and purpose of a legislative act. The legislative act, in paraphrase, and simply says that there's going to be an investigation and determination for an infectious agent for this thing they call COVID, the symptoms. The symptoms of which apparently are modified flu-like symptoms and nothing more. In other words, without just COVID, just flu-like symptoms, stuffy head, cough, fever type stuff means nothing. Basing your decisions on just coffee, head, fever, whatever, is nothing. You need an underlying infectious agent that's more than presumptive, that's demonstrated to exist and be the cause, is in your statutes to establish that the health authority imposing its police power has jurisdiction. How does the federal authority come into your state and have roughshod where I told you the international health regulation that the United States government of 2005, that the United States government agreed, um, signed on to, had that reservation I've read to you. And it essentially examples what the establishment of the United States is, and I've explained that in that prior broadcast that the state health authority is the exclusive power relative to that. How would foreigners, suggestions, recommendations, aspirations, guidances, or whatever, have any sway? And now we see it's over there in Ohio, and a woman gets tased, say, saying that she, she's not breaking no law or nothing, you can't do that. Well, if you go read far enough, they didn't get her for not wearing the mask. And this is the other trick. This is a jujitsu move they put on everybody. you got to be anticipating. They got her for a bit trespassing, essentially. And that's a whole different thing, and you didn't set up the problem, and so now you got that to deal with. And so they moved the goalposts, and you didn't even know how to, you don't even know how to defend yourself on that. You couldn't do it the first step. So watch these moves, moves that they do. Watch what they actually charge you with. Not for you, they charge you with it. They find an example of what to expect. And you put, if you were interested, you put your thought in that and you figure out what you have to do to counter. One of the things I've come up with is if you start an administrative proceeding with your public health office and you send them, you want to know where they determine what, how, what measure they do, where the CDC says there's no test, how did they come to a determination of what the cause was? You start the process and any answer that doesn't have evidence is a continuation of the cause. That's a piece of paper you have in your pocket walk around and you say, no, this is under administ the, the, the laws don't look like they're valid. Here's the administrative paperwork that's under review right now. You don't have an authority. And at least you have that notice to the one who's going to be the so-called enforcer, and you remove, you strip them of all their good faith reliance. They can say, oh, I don't care what that says, but then you have them for good faith. Uh, Dara, you have for willful, flagrant disregard, which is more additional adjectives you can throw a heap on them. Most people are already rolling their eyes and saying, I don't want to do all that. This is the day that they've got us in, folks. You don't. Your silence is their victory. General measures underneath this rule. General measures for the effective control of reportable diseases. They're number one, just to go through a couple of this, so you, so you can hear how the CDC, a federal, foreign, out-of-the-jurisdiction authority, can even have a say. And, and despite what the United States government explained, couldn't be and reserved to the states. So you got to understand how the, the, the corruption sits in the system to see and how it's all wrong and yet it continues until you become like the Native American living on a reservation that was stolen from you and it was supposed to be a different way and you were supposed to have some say and until you forced it back from the criminals that took it, you're not going to have the life that was put to you in per perpetuity by the organic documents. The local health official or the commissioner or a designated representative of the commissioner, upon receiving a report of a reportable disease or of a suspected epidemic of disease or of a suspected case of disease of public health significance event, shall. That starts the imperative, okay? The shall. Because there's a list of things that go on. I'm not here to read you the code. You need to read it for yourself, but you need to understand how they're able to bring the CDC in, notwithstanding what the federal government reserved, notwithstanding what the constitutional requirements are, and what notwithstanding the, the exclusive power of the state. 
And here we're acknowledging there's an exclusive police power in the state to do what it's doing. The question becomes, is did they do what they needed in order to invoke it? That's the question. And you do it to the black and white statute that says that. But here in the rule, and understand how this works, the rule is not the law. The rule is as law. The rule is presumed to implement the legislative enactment to which it refers. And you'll see in the bottom, when you get the link here, it refers to a section. It happens to be the same section that says you're going to be looking to determine this infectious agent, this epidemic disease. Epidemic is communicable and COVID together, not to separate like they tend to try and do. And I'm going to show you how the word susceptible now is not used in street language. I just found this out, and this became another claim, that it's been it's used in ignorance, essentially, to trap everybody. And it's the, it's the way it's, it looked to me. I, I don't know how people read this. To me, it looks like the precautionary principle silently sitting in these codes put in years before that we read over expressly in the Australian law, where if they don't know, you're locked down because you can't prove, is what the word susceptible essentially means when I get there. But shall, this is the local health authority, shall. This, that's in number one underneath the general measures of effective control of reportable diseases. Another clue, it has to be a reportable disease. And so there's big, again, is it a disease when they say COVID? No, it can't be because disease, a reportable disease is a communicable disease. COVID is just the symptoms, not the communicable part. It's a car without gas. It's a COVID-19. Sport model, as it might be, it ain't going nowhere without the communicable. And so let's roll down a little bit, and we go down to, what is it now, 1E, uh, and I, we read uh, another thing, establish, to establish control, this is what they're supposed to do with this, control measures, which may include, this is a license given to them to consider, deference, may include examination, treatment, isolation, quarantine, exclusion, disinfection, immunization, disease, surveillance, closure of establishments, education, and other measures considered appropriate by medical experts for the protection of the public's health. So this is a may, a deference that shall happen. Now, who are these medical experts? Go down to roll down to number three in this section. For the purpose of this section, appropriate medical experts. That's a term. Appropriate medical experts. Medical experts is a term. The three-word term, a two-word term. You have another one, you'll find other types of experts. They all have a slightly different connotation. You have to consider to read for this. But in this case, the appropriate medical experts shall mean. So we have a shall, the local health authority shall do this stuff, and they shall regard appropriate medical experts to be and to mean here, mean in the general, it's not specific, it could be more. Mean, we use word, the word mean in the rule, this is promulgated as law, force and effect as law, as long as it survives and continues. Shall mean that the latest edition of the report of the Committee on Infectious Diseases of the American Academy of Pediatrics or the Control of Communicable Disease Manuals by the American Public Health Association, latest edition, Consideration will also be given to recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and other current recommendations issued by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The United States Department of Health and Human Services, this guy's coming up in a second, he's going to explain something to you in a video. Additionally, in information provided directly from the Department of the Division of Communicable Disease Control or the Division of Tuberculosis Control shall be considered appropriate control measures for the, dis the protection of public health and may be used instead of the other cited references. And so these are the deference and the imperatives that are the foreign imposition, as I see it, as a cancer that's supposed to implement the local determination. This part of the rule, as promulgated, appears to me to violate the determination that's made locally where they shall and will give preference to these appropriate medical experts. 
when you look at the record of these appropriate medical experts, they're a far cry from being appropriate. And so this is, a, we also see then we have a four, and we know now why, if the state of Ohio, and I would say you will find the identical provisions in your uh, Ohio law, whether that's law or whether that's the rule, the promulgation, purporting to implement the rule, you will find that the, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has a shall imperative of imposition. The, I'm not going to talk about it. There's some other rules in this state that actually reference these types of medical experts that do bring in the imperative will happen relative to their their recommendations. I want to remind you, recommendations, international law, were reserved from imposition on the state by the IHR, the International Health Regulation 2005 Reservation of the United States Government, to the states, the power to remain there. And so, this rule comes in to make it look like the state has consented to this interference. And so what we've done, and we'll be developing, and hopefully correctly here, developing that this capacity to do this has wrongfully interfered with what was supposed to be done under the legislative enactment. The legislature required a certain due process and a certain consideration to be made to validate, to create the correct, ability to demonstrate the exigent to dis, the circumstance of the exigent circumstance to notify everybody what that specifically was that's not a presumption it's a demonstrated thing and this rule tends to give the authority over as a deference to the authority of a foreigner is not anybody that can be looking local to you is the type of thing i notice when i see rules and even stat, uh, enactments that subvert your local authority in preference to a foreigner, in other words, an international authority. And you know that from the CDC, it runs on over to the to the uh, the WHO, not the Rock Group or the OWL, but the World Health Organization. And so here we have the nugget inside the rule, and what we're going to try and do on this, and we'll see what, how this works out. We're going to attempt to get, in an equity case, we're going to, we've got some things to work out, but there's a an equity court has the power in order to what they call rectify or reform. And if you, you again, it's not, not typically known. And it's not, I haven't seen it typically done recently. And I don't think I would expect to see it when we've got an oppressor controlling, oppressive, wrongful actor inside the seats of your government to see much of this. But you, you reform this rule to remove the prevailing nature of the foreigner that divested the disposed of the legislative intent and purpose to find locally by the local by the local authority and so this is an internal cancer that sits there that an equity you can get rid of why i was offering to you what i have been and hoping people would step up and we could step up into these technical aspects and the bottom line is you only get what you assert if you've never heard of anything before you didn't believe it was uh, uh, there or that they want to, you believe that they're just going to shut you down. How about if you ask anyway? How about if you position your your, your petition or your, your whatever your demand in such a way that when they don't, they are now outed for continuing the harms that they're, the, the, the disaster, the man-made disaster created by this. And I'm a bit parroting some work that we're doing right now. So this is not, I guess what I'm saying there is we're, I'm not just whistling Dixie behind the woodshed when this stuff is being implemented. This is not a just an idea. This is becoming something hopefully that will be read in a, in a near in a near future in, a, in earnest, not as oh, some letter of opinion. Now, let's move on uh, to here. Let me look at this word susceptible in the next example. And we see it defined. And our thought, I, my thought is, our thought is susceptible means re, 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 responsive to, uh, available to something. Uh, what Here's the, the definition in the rule that works as law. Susceptible means a person or an animal not known to be immune to a specific disease. Now, when you think, think about that, not a person or animal not known to be immune to a specific disease, and you look at the condition we're in, is anybody known to be immune? 
Do they even have a test for that? Do they even try? Have you ever heard them trying to find whether or not they're immune? No, this is one of those proportionality statements that if you can't prove yourself immune, then you will be part of the potential problem because you're the potential problem. A person or animal not known to be immune to a specific disease means all you all, and this is part of the power. I literally had to go change the, a document, a, a petition, when I found out that the word susceptible was defined, and it was by this, uh, this little thing that I ran across, because I was using it in the term of immunity. Susceptible being a measure of immunity. It doesn't mean that in the as law rule. And it, what it does is it makes you presumed guilty of being contagious when there's ignorance. And I don't know how about you, but I don't think that's a standard that due process should allow, but that they put in here. And so this is the things that you start thinking about. How do I address this? That definition's allowing them to come after everybody. And yet the law of intent of the, of the legislature was to come after only those they could find could be potentially a problem. That potentially a problem is an interesting thing. How do, that's the susceptibility is immunity question. But susceptibility is not defined that way. And so you see this little twist that allows the, to, the expansion of what should have been a very focused authority. And so, as example, for those of you that are thinking about this, and maybe not, and they find interest of it, and maybe what you might be addressing, this is one of those good faith reliance problems inside the rule. And you have to defeat that good faith reliance, even since it was in the rule, where you then show that none of these things that have been put in the rule and promulgated should have passed to be a rule, because they definitely, they certainly subjugate, uh, subvert the intent and purpose of the legislature, where its point was to confine the investigation and determination to be allowing the one who's going to wield police power the demonstrable exigency in general now, how, what is going to invoke that power to the, then they can then implement the rule, which if you look further in the same rules, you'll find other definitions. It's to be the least, they say the rule here, and this is proper, it's to the least interference, not the most. And so we have a, a dynamic that's, that needs to be spoken to that gets a lot more involved but not not over cumbersome. It's just the fact that we've been invaded, and now we have to kind of weed out all the cancer cells, if you will. We've got to be our own inoculation. But that's the way this place was wired. It's not my rule. Communicable disease. So this is this. I want to get to this this term. It, it's all defined here. Communicable disease. We can find out. This is what the subject matter is about. It's they say communicable and disease. And so this whole thing is 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 tailored to have to find first what uh, you can have a disease. You can have a set of symptoms. But then you have to track down the cause. And it may not be a virus. It could be any kind of thing that's causing a mass, widespread problem for the population, which has been given to the government to stop. Not mitigate. Stop. And this is another little thing that goes on. You start reading the rules, how they uh, insidiously came in and they changed certain things. And all of a sudden it changes what they can rely on and do. Enough that they can rely on stuff like the WHO is talking about, which is a completely political agenda that is admitted now uh, and destroy you in your in your uh, local in your local cities and towns and whatever without any due process with just on a suggestion a recommendation and your governors are actually agreeing to that pretty fascinating pretty fascinating Dur communicable disease an illness due to an infectious agent or its toxic products which is transmitted directly or indirectly to a well person from an infected person or animal and through the agency of an intermediate animal host, vector, or inanimate environment. And so there are people that know about this subject matter way better than I do as far as a medical exactness. So we just take the surface. I'm not going to try and discuss all this. There might be a, someone, uh, some clever academic that could just t try to turn taffy into this. The point I want to point you to Whatever they want to say in the lower part of this section was, they also say that it's a infectious agent or it's toxic products. That's dem a demonstrated, not a presumptive condition. And then they say to a well person, did they ever test well people? Is there a test for well people? 
We can prove that they didn't and that there's not when they have come out in the CDC now. We use now the shall in position that the state lo the, sh the local used without filtering, without checking, where we find 94% had comorbidities. And that COVID-19 as a disease cannot be anything novel. It's a flu-like symptoms, making the other 4% fraud. So we have two conditions, if you know how to look at this, that the rule requires. On the one hand, they've allowed a cancer. On the other hand, they're not even following what the rule is if, if we just give it to them. So we have to have an infection, a determined infectious agent, not a presumed infectious agent, a real thing existing, which you read in the panel, the diagnostic panel, there is no such isolate for the one that they presume. And then we don't even have the loading correct on what it would take. And we certainly don't know what well persons are. I don't get a wrap around the well the person. It, are you well? Do they have a test? Let's just look at what the point of it is here. No. So when you start reading this and you can start to build up once you start your initial content, contact and you make a record that all these things have failed, you're finding out that the governors don't have any authority at all. And so the, ex the excuse that you're still whining and complaining about being locked down or that you've got to fight with someone else or you can get accosted, a 250-pound, 300-pound uh, man that we put his will on a 100-pound woman for not wearing a mask who then claims I got asthma, all that's ir irrelevant because they didn't have the power to do any of it. The, the, the woman shouldn't have even been attacked. And then you get abducted. You know, I hear a lot of people saying kidnapped. You're not a kid. You get abducted. In any rate, there may be no distinction. The point is, is that you have a different observation. Here they have to have two incommunicable disease. When I say communicable disease, it's not just finding that infectious agent, isn't it? It has to be. You have to find that it's affecting well people. How is that? Did you ever hear about that? Well, I didn't actually hear about that until I just read it here just this last week. And I said, well, isn't this interesting? What's there in the black and white to protect us that none of the officials have done? None. Why? How? How? Well, that, that's the point. Why would every official not honor the law, or even the as law, even the wrong law, and not explain it? Do you think maybe they should have, in their governor's orders and the reports, they should have referred to what? What would they have referred to? The expert, right? That uh, infectious disease in American Academy of Pediatrics or the Control of uh, Communicable Diseases Manual, right? You'd think that they would refer to that, but they didn't, because they're not really referring to that. No, they're using the CDC's lies and bad promotions in order to try and get it past you, and nobody said anything about it. So, move on over. What's an epidemic? A disease outbreak. They put the two terms together. The occurrence in the community, a region, of one or more causes of illness that is in excess of normal expectation. Back to there is no test. I've told you the CDC and the FDA agrees there is no test for an infectious agent, the presumptive infectious agent. This the term of epidemic, I've told you, you can't even agree there's an epidemic. Talking about COVID is talking to the wind relative to substance and dem demonstration. The occurrence in the community of a region of one of the more cases, one or more cases of illness. What is that? Well, it has to do with what? It has to do with these designated uh, infectious agents and the illness has to have the cause and yet did you hear any of that discussed in these orders they all have to be it's like a, a patent they have to have a chain of authority their their points of order their points of fact have to tie together to give them the power in their signature at the bottom that they are invoking the power that they seek which is the police power which gives them this awesome awesome power to destroy when it's not checked. So that's a quick view through one set of rules in a state different than the Ohio story where the CDC has sway. And I wanted to point out inside the, the rules, not the law, but inside the rules, it's been, it's been distorted to allow foreign agents to have sway over your local officials. And so when I get to you, when I say that, it reminds me again to tell you, not only do you have to point out that this is the problem, but you have to show a uh, cause and effect that was wrong. And so that's a little bit more work uh, that you have to find out that the reliance on that, they, the local official had different uh, things to rely upon. 
that should have warned them off of the suggestions and recommendations, notwithstanding the shall or the will or that they were otherwise viewed, these, or agent, these foreign agents in your state are deemed to be appropriate. You have to put that statement together. In a and so here's an appropriate medical expert. In a stunning reversal, CDC says it's published new guidance on risks of airborne COVID-19 in error. Okay, so this is the, the reliance that there you have on this uh, error. This is not error. This becomes fraud. This was a test flight. This is also showing the strong arming, if you will, or the attempted influence, and I call it undue influence, of the WHO. Again, not the rock group or the owl, not, not hooting, singing songs. No, this is a group of criminals, non-government organization criminals on a global scale that are, is the hub of the tyranny, medical tyranny against you, uh, that the CDC now we acknowledge to come together and that they can be strong-armed on top of that. And they play this game like they put in things like this is the first error they've ever done. No, the 94% uh, comorbidity statement was another one of error. The fact that they promote that the serology test, and when you look at the serology test, it doesn't do, it's a blood test, but it doesn't actually show you SARS-CoV-2 and can't. It's not an error, folks. So this is not the first error, but it's been outed. Uh, again, this is a fear tactic. This is all terrorism. And you, you can go through all this, and I'm kind of mentioning parts and pieces of what's been put together here over the last few, month or so in a complaint that you can pull together, not as opinion, it's all in the documents to expose and the definitions of black and white to compare to. What's your court case? It's the evidence, the unassailable, undoubted, beyond reasonable doubt evidence, self-evident evidence with the law applied. That's your case. All right, so if you don't come with that, you don't come with anything. And it is a lot of work. But to me, it's becoming an observation. It's really just a really formal book report. And we all hated to do book reports. So I got you. I understand that. But they're utilizing the failure of our filing that book report on Friday. We don't get the gold star on Monday. In fact, they just take a bunch of stuff from you. That condition is where we are today. And after reading, after publishing guidance warning with the serious risks of airborne infection associated with SARS-CoV-2, the CDC just seriously harmed its own credibility by acknowledging Monday that it had posted the new guidance in error following a pressure campaign from the WHO. Well, it had to be a pressure campaign because that AIHR 2005 says it's a reservation. And so how are these people in the CDC feeling pressure at all? shows you that there's a little bit more of a, at least an implied relationship than there ought to be, an undue influence that's able to be imparted, the appearance of impropriety that it could, and then it actually got to someone actually typing up, you know, websites just don't, web page just doesn't just appear, just appear because someone thinks of it. I don't know if any of you have ever made a website, but they just don't pop up because you have a website domain, and I want that website. All right, so there's a whole lot of action going on here. It kind of gets washed underneath the, error, the, the idea of an error. Scientists have been gathering evidence of, that the novel coronavirus plaguing the world spreads via aerosol particles practically since it first emerged. Let me just stop right there. I can't even read some of this more. Zero Hedge is a plant, has to be a plant uh, website. And so you have to read very critically when you deal with Zero Hedge. They're actually saying that there's a novel coronavirus plaguing the world here. They didn't cause it to be a question. They didn't go look at their own state laws to say that there's never, ever been a determination of the cause, whether it could be SARS-CoV-2 or not. And so, I, I mean, I always have to stop reading. I see that. I'll just shut, I'll just shut this story down right there for you. However, I'm here to expose, uh, hope, uh, certain aspects. And so we'll continue reading. Aerosol particles, again, we've heard that promotion, and it's coming back. Why? Because they want, they need to extend, they got to kick this can down the road. they got to have their, tertiary, their secondary and tertiary wave, don't you know? And I've told you, if you get your document written, the second wave is proof their mitigation strategies did not work, cannot work. Why? Because they never identified the infectious agent, and they were derelict from March when those orders issued. That's how fast you get back there to prove that what they're going into is not going to work. 
because we're looking at something even more heinous, which is these vaccines. If they don't have an infectious agent, they can identify what's the vaccine. They call it coronavirus now, the common cold. You think? You think that's even possible? Where's the best science there? The best science is BS. That's why it's there. Nobody speaks up about it. Uh, back in July, a group of 200 scientists sent a letter to the WHO urging the International Public Health Agency to change its guidance on the spread of the disease. The problem, scientists argued, is that the WHO, not the rock group or the owl again, it's just this World Health Organization organized criminal syndicate has updated its views to incorporate new research showing that aerosol spread is a much greater threat than touching a contaminated surfaces via large droplets. So again, this is the promotion. Let's go back to the point. Where is the certification demonstrating the exact existence of an infectious cause? You notice they didn't say for COVID. They just said for aerosol. If you look very carefully, they omitted to say even it's even aerosolization was even relevant to COVID at all or any any sickness. And so remember about the silence that happens around these stories. So pardon me, I'm so insulted already because of what I, I read before uh, relative to Zero Hedge saying, claiming there's a novel coronavirus that's plaguing the world. I don't know that I want to read much more. You can go read through it. They claim it's an error. If they can claim it's an error or a mistake, they get a, they get a pass. You have to identify it can't be a pass. It's a fraud. They knew or should have known is another thing you put in. But you have to prove they knew or should have known. Find the evidence that they knew or should have known. Again, they just did this the website just didn't pop up. This wasn't no error. This is floating a balloon to see how much you're going to buy into it. Even in your repulsion and lack of answer, it's an answer. So where does this go? Because you don't have your traveling papers. What kind of traveling papers? Not your driver's license, not your ID. Now it's your medical martial law traveling papers. Police surround elderly woman and snatch mobile phone. Dramatic footage has come captured a bizarre standoff between five police officers and two elderly women sitting in a Melbourne park bench. The video posted to uh, uh, on Sunday, you know where they get posted, uh, shows the officers surrounding the two women as one of them saying, no, I'm not standing up. On what grounds am I under arrest? This is unlawful, the woman said. She then went on to raise her voice again, questioning why she was under arrest. A female officer replied, for failing to provide your name and address. Understand how they changed the goalpost. Now you have to understand that you need to say, what was the crime that I need to give you my name and address? But what crime did you think I was co going to commit? So now you got to go through a dialogue, and because part of this is not set up right uh, to start with, and it is imposing. And I know these old ladies, these, these elderly, excuse me, these elderly, not old, these elderly women have never listened to, don't even know I exist behind the woodshed. They didn't listen to me explain what Australians have to do. Again, I didn't get no response from the people that asked for the help and are asking, uh, telling people about the problem to tell me that what I was saying was a load or that they were trying to apply it. And I won't even give their name. It's not about pointing out the people who don't respond that like to talk, 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 complain, make alarm, sensationalism, but don't follow through. Here you have what I was telling you. You don't have your traveling papers. You don't have your, for Australia would be the same thing, the determination of an infectious agent, not by presumption, but by demonstrable existence, some demonstrated thing. And you don't have put it into administrative review, which continues the question for the government until they show you. I've talked all about this in mining law. I told you, just to remind you, 21 pages. They came back to us with a charge. The Forest Service came to us with a charge. We were violating the law under a rule. That rule, I told you, go look and read, likely for at least miners in, in Forest Service land, which is not Forest Service land. It's just what the jurisdiction that they have to manage. The miner has his own private land in holding that land, and the law says so. And I returned an answer not to be agreeing to their authority to challenge it. And then I went 21 more pages to explain how wrong they were. And that that paper, and it was admitted to me they didn't understand what I was talking about, and I said, well, that's not, not uh, un, I agree that that might be what you don't understand, because I'm talking to you in the law, and you don't follow the law. I got 21 pages of law you don't understand. That's That's understandable. 
But you don't have an authority until you answer those things to even talk to us anymore. That is our statement. Your obligations to protect us and your obligation and duty now to refute everything of 21 pages is what I'm telling you to do about COVID. Okay, so this is not that hard, and it's not like I just have opinions and ideas for you. you gotta, you got to assert yourself, and there's certain ways to do it. And so these women are accosted, elderly women are accosted by cops, costumed enforcers that don't care about you, don't have the decency in them to care about you. And yet, here we are in that day, I get a lot of not silence back, get no support really from anybody, no interest, but I hear lots of complaining uh, when I, about whether or not, or at all that they may in the future be involved in something that where they uh, so will come down with a mandatory thing. You can't even go out to a park bench. You can't even live your life out as an elderly woman uh, and uh, who supported the the country to that point because that's the way they'll be looking at it, and they'll exploit you even the same. On what? On nothing. Literally nothing. On a car named COVID without gas to go anywhere. And you claim that you're not doing anything wrong. The police think you are. And the only way to stop that is to point out that you're already in dialogue with the government. And the government hasn't answered to strip them of at least a good faith reliance. They're doing anything. Whether they believe it or not, it's a whole different step right there. Growing research indicates many COVID-19 cases might not be infectious at all. You think? But anyway, but here's more evidence, okay? We can keep going on and on about this. I'm not reading the news to you. I'm saying here's evidence that the experts, the appropriate medical experts are liars, are not actually appropriate. And yet your law says they are, is something you have to fix. And in the proper remedy, you can um, get, a, if you can get them to do that, and I have the, I only say that the law would require this, but because of the occupation you live under and not enough of us is pushing that forward, it may not yet happen, but you'd at least have the exa the evidence that they won't do it. And if you tie together the fact of the bar with these members and their support of sustainable development and that they want to bring this on because the WHO is a part of this attack against you, the societal and economic attack against you through the under color of a public health crisis that doesn't exist. It's a, it's a, it's someone's fantasy. And they're utilizing it. Many characters, many agents are utilizing this. And nobody says stop. No one shows how. It is, a, it is astonishing to me. But growing up, a body of research suggests that a number of, a significant number of confirmed COVID infections in the United States, perhaps as many as 9 out of 10. I like the CDC number. That was 94%. But we have confirmation here. Right? So this is just how this works. And I wouldn't even say that maybe you would re necessarily refer to this one. I think the CDC admission is a lot better because of the comorbidities. And we'd be back to a well person. Uh, if you're not well, well, then they didn't test for being well. Then how could they fulfill that rule over there in that other state? Right? And all these rules are similar in all states. So this is, I'm speaking to all of y'all. If you just take a few minutes to go read. Yes, it could be a little confusing that we got it laid out. I, there's one state that they put everything in PDF, so you can tell how tedious and, and how tedious that's been to try and research through. But anyway, that's what you kind of got to put up with. They do this stuff on purpose, I'm sure, but that's no excuse. They're destroying your life. They're taking your stuff. They're 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 going to destroy your future. They're destroying your future. They actually destroyed your future, but we'll see. I say they destroyed it because you're not responding. But anyway, get back to they get. A little upset about thinking about that. Nine out of ten, many uh, not infectious at all, with uh, much of the co country's testing equipment possibly picking up mere fragments of the disease rather than flu full-blown infections. Enough said. This has been stated behind the woodshed for months and months and months. And so what did we hear, and what do I even spring this up? We heard, I think it was in the Wisconsin case, that the, the judiciary would at that time not move to counter the deference given to the government to execute lawful, lawfully the police power they had invoked. What did I tell you? That means that nobody challenged that they had lawfully invoked well, the police power. So the court gave them the deference to, do, to decide. And so they went on. But the court reserved that. They would be watching in the future to see how it rolled out, whether or not facts could sustain the power that was invoked, which I told you was exactly 
what you attack as well, especially now that it, what eight months has gone or six seven months has gone on uh, since the March the March time when the orders finally came out that you can see like I've told you none of their things are working, which means that they never really identified anything and they didn't. There's no certified finding, and yet now we see the ramifications of all that. Their testing procedures were failed. They were known to be failed. This is not even new. What did I say before? We've talked about the Whoopenkopf case. They knew the PCR test could not establish an infectious agent that could not identify what they thought was a Whoopenkopf epidemic that eventually just disappears and they never knew what it was. We see PCR is not the tool, cannot be the tool. We already knew that. We knew it then. Well, we know it now, and you assert that now again as a continuing proof that they don't know what they're doing, even though they're considered appropriate medical experts. So you go in and you attack that. You can move that to be changed. You can't consider these people as appropriate experts. Cut that out. That's interfering with the local decision that was improper to do so. But moving on in a conversation that was interesting to me in the in from who it came from and what it talks to relative to COVID, and then what I've told you about what the source of this authority was to give license to a meat companies to continue. Corporate capture in action emails illustrate the meat industry's role in keeping plants open despite COVID-19. I take all this as meaning the author believed that these meat companies should be closed because of COVID-19. In fact, the article is an objection to the integration of the meat industry with President Trump to offer him how a draft of how they should be viewed under Title 50, of all things, folks, to keep your meat supply running. Now, you understand here what the condition and problem is. COVID-19 is flu-like symptoms. I don't think we've ever closed any food processor for flu-like symptoms. Yet this author is seemingly uh, aghast at this condition that the such influence would be had by the meat industry that they would say we got to keep our food products open, production open, otherwise we're going to go down. But using Title 50 to do it, remember about Title 50, that's the war powers of the government to hurt you. That was another thing that was ironic about that. It was used to actually help you, and yet someone's complaining. In another example of the value of the Freedom of Information Act, two groups have obtained emails documenting these pressures to keep the meat supply going. This was considered pressures. ProPublica on uh, September 14, 2020, quote, emails show the meatpacking industry drafted an executive order to keep plants open. Hundreds of emails offer a rare look at the meat industry's influence and access to the highest levels of government. The draft was submitted a week before Trump's executive order, which bore striking similarities. Well, I would be jealous of that high level of government access. Jefferson Mining District has attempted to contact this president four times, I think it is, I gave it for sure three times, to explain how the sustainable development thing that starts COVID, that you can tie back into it, climate change, we wanted access to the, the, the president because under international law, relative to our default judgment, the president's the only way to stop this thing internationally. And it meet because the, what happened is the allowance of this invasion, the allowance of COVID allows other countries in international law to come help and save you from your own leaders. Yeah, I dig up a lot of this esoteric sound and stuff, I can tell you that. And the only reason that didn't happen is because the strength of the United States government's military to say that they're bringing you safety and security. And if you want to talk about how upside down and topsy-turvy this is, here we're back to this. People are complaining about the access to the president to keep your food system running underneath COVID threat. And so let me go back down. Uh, they go and they talk and they have examples about this. I guess I just stop and talk about this. They keep talking about this. I found this fascinating. They reference Title 50. They're referencing the same war powers to keep your food supply going as the a law that has the exceptions to the government harming you. And I've never seen this website discuss the harms that I'll tell you that are there 
that are available to read the exceptions within Title 50 that they're, the government uses to harm you. I've never heard this website talk in that regard. But they do come along and they, they attack or they um, give notice that there's this undue, supposedly undue influence keeping your supply under the same title. Showed, it was just, and I sent off an email, I mean a Twitter. I could not, I really believe it. They talk about COVID. My question on that, back to the poster, was what risk? What risk was this meat company actually defending itself again? That they had to, underneath this supposed risk of COVID, is really another anomaly, isn't it? COVID-19 is nothing. It's a, it's a car without gas. It's a speedster without fuel. It's, no go, no va, no go. What risk was COVID to this whole thing is zero. That the complaint that there was any influence at all of the president to protect the meat system in this country, the challenge to that of power, that influence, is pretty interesting. And I make the next statement here. What risk? There's no one causative certification. There's not one causative certification. Nowhere ever is there the certification as to the infectious agent. As I said last week's broadcast, the title it, There Is No Spoon. That's the trick. You think there's a spoon. There is no spoon to this magic show. There's no spoon that I'm melting and twisting and everything. You just believe I hold one. That's COVID. There is no test proves it. And then, I, I say, and then to be silent all the time on the real harms Title 50 has and is covering relative to the website, never mentioning these things while they complain about the adulteration to the food system. All allowed through war powers. And then I make the observation, real interesting overall cognitive dissonance right there. And this is on a website I've, I use regularly to expose the beautiful information that we would never have on what the real problems are. But to focus in on an illusion, to then claim an undue influence that keeps your food going, something that they would agree with on that website, is really the, wow, I mean, mind talk about mind-bending. Like overall cognitive dissonance is like, is OCD, is also I put in there relative to the capitalization. And so I see, again, how do you analyze these things? I told you, whenever you find COVID, you're dealing with people that don't understand. They'll make up things that don't aren't in real existence. And you have to look through that. You have to get past and through that. For you and me, and amongst ourselves in the streets, we don't. I wouldn't even address it. Where the officials are using that as a color of authority to destroy you, you have to address it. And I've been talking to you for months on how this is supposed to work. I don't know why people haven't embraced it. I don't know why I don't get more people passing the broadcast around. And while I talk about, thank you, it's the sound minds you didn't, you know, I've been noticing, you know, we've been going at this for quite a few uh, weeks now. Uh, you you rebroadcast real time as you can uh, the broadcast, and I appreciate that as I think about that. More people coming to see this. And so I'm not talking about those that do pass the broadcast. I'm talking about all that listen and continue listening and continue to do nothing or complain or even don't listen and complain. Well, this thing is demonstrably, demonstrably beyond a reasonable doubt provable to be the weapons used to destroy you. And you say nothing. And I don't see more people that don't get on this view and start exercising it to become a, a real force to be reckoned with. What, what is uh, Q? Why aren't? Why isn't your rights more important than Q? Which I always kind of laugh at. When I saw Q, do you realize it's a, what is it? this is a Q score? This is a marketing. A Q store is a brand's market share, if you will. It's it's influence in the in the in the invi in the marketplace. What's your Q score? No, I know I don't even have one. It's like naked. I don't want to talk about it. It's useless. But it's indi indicative of the mentality of people would rather look at continue in the reality game show and the market share that's going. I so, saw, in fact, I pointed something like that out this morning. It was a Twitter post. They're pointing out that. The QAnon movement is now a, a, embracing some other other thing, and wow, that's going to be crazy. No, this is just a brand grabbing more market share. What's your Q score? Now, why are people more interested in that than getting behind a woodshed, which 
Again, I know why. It means that they have to take responsibility and actually start figuring out how someone's doing them dirt. And I was going to get crass there, but I'm going to hold my tongue. There's a new federal court to handle all the expected COVID vaccine injury claims. Again, from John Rappaport, another guy. I like him a lot, but where is he with all that he knows? Fascinating what people, a, a brilliant people, just not coming together. Don't, don't have a, won't either acknowledge what I'm saying, don't support what I'm saying, would rather ignore me or whatever. But he said he's got stuff. And I've told you about his stuff. But nothing else besides talking about this stuff. It is, okay, I'm feeling myself getting irritated. There's a new federal court to handle the vaccine injury, your COVID vaccine. Do you think they're setting up the COVID injury because they're not going to allow, allow the vaccine? Notwithstanding all the questions, you need to take stock in what's happening here. They've already given immunity. And I'm going to play a little thing here that was just talked about but the uh, the sec House uh, the um, Human Services Secretary coming up this last weekend, the Health and Human Services HHS. Remember that's also the shall will take advice and recommendation from these people. It's a, another organization like the CDC. Let me play you this little thing. It's a video that came out. This uh, a snippet of the video. I also have a link to the more full conversation. It was uh, done off of Fox News Business. I don't, again, if I don't see this come through a Twitter or someone sent it to me, I don't see it. But I'm going to play this and you listen very carefully what they have. This is under the first one I have has uh, that where this uh, Azar states that the Operation Warp Speed has changed the game of drug development. So for me, that's looking the game, the reality game show, the game. This is all you're being gamed and listen to what he admits here even though they claim that they're doing tests. Only a few seconds. Listen carefully. I hope it's, uh, here we go. So right now it's just going to be data, and every vaccine, all six of the vaccines we're working with are in industrial-scale manufacturing now. We literally have millions of doses of vaccine already. Uh okay, so that's enough. Game changer, they have millions of doses already in a commercially implemented production system on six. Do you think he's lying to you? Do you think that uh, we're just taking that out of context? I gave you the larger context. When you get to the link, you can listen for it. Today. He says a whole lot more things. They have millions of doses waiting. John Rappaport points out, and this, I just get it from him because he, he mentioned it, and it's something I can go too quick. He mentions that there's a vaccine court for y'all relative to these very same vaccines that are already in storage, already millions, already made before the test results, which he then says it's all going to be about the data. That's cooked books, as far as I can tell. This is one of the people influencing your state government and shall influence your state government to the exclusion, apparently, of the local government not fulfilling the legislature's intent and purpose that due process be fulfilled in the determination of an actual in fact, demonstrable exigency, which invokes the police power, which will be used to stop, stop that thing. Vaccines don't stop that thing. This is for future. You heard it from the gentleman in the office who I uh, did some quick read, just a quick look at Wiki. He's an attorney and he's a pharmaceutical lobbyist for other information that you might want to tie together. Uh, but here's the admission. But they are already stockpiling vaccines before the test runs. They already have knowledge they're going to need a vaccine court to do what? He also talks about just the same thing that they got the the pharmaceutical companies to do child's vaccines was to limit the economic risk. He has that power, he says, this guy right here. And so if you don't think the tables are shifted against you and you could remain silent and you can just uh, argue or not argue at all and just turn you and just wait for the thing, it'll finally come to you maybe. This is being used, these agencies, federal agents are being used to come into your state to turn uh, turn down, turn around what was supposed to be reserved to the states and to be preserved by the states, notwithstanding we don't agree, we don't enjoy that quite yet. It's all because we all be, we're too quiet, we're too silent. But they have millions of doses already in storage. That's not my opinion. That comes right out of the guy's mouth. 
And so what I've on that note, would your cunt would your country do something against you to cause a bigger problem? Remember, those vaccines are supposed to be novel. Those come out of the biodiversity treaty. A treaty allowed for GMOs. Those was agreed to around the world in, this, in that biodiversity convention. It was agreed that DNA, genome, and things would be shared. Apply that to COVID, so-called, even as a scam. Right? Can apply that to the bioweapons labs. And look at the UN's uh, purpose under the WHO for this is emerging diseases. Emerging diseases that are novel are the ones that the pharmaceutical company for which the WHO brokers this organized criminal syndicate brokers to the to this thing and the sharing that's going on around the nations for somebody's profit, not yours I can guarantee you. They broker this stuff and they put it in its future prediction of constant and endless emerging diseases through this international organization. Would the country actually do that against its people? And I heard the little story from Grimner this weekend, or excuse me, Friday, on Freaker's Ball. And he went, there's 53 admitted false flag attacks that he was reading from. And I just want to go down to number seven. Israel admits that in 1954, an Israeli terrorist cell operating in Egypt planted bombs in several buildings, including U.S. diplomatic facilities, then left behind evidence implicating the Arabs as the culprits. The ones of the bombs detonated prematurely. One of the bombs detonated prematurely, allowing the Egyptians to identify the bombers, and several of the Israelis later confessed. Sounds just like 9-11 to me. But they got away with it because the first bomb didn't go off. They all went off. And the government allows it. The United States government allows it. I could go on through a list of these 53 false flags. I put a Twitter, I said, waving false flags. This is what's going on. Would a government allow that? Was Israel able to do plant bombs in buildings? Sure they are. Could that be happening to us? Well, we talked about this other little pipsqueak of a company having all this technology to come after us. Look at the underpinnings of some of these corporations that are going on to do this. Not to focus anything on Israel more than to say, Will some company, a wood country, a company, will one country plant bombs and build, take down buildings to plant, uh, to make discourse and discord in another country? Yeah. So this brings up the other idea here. Did China do that to us and we willfully, willfully allowed it through our officials? And then we willfully as people allowed it because we didn't challenge our officials when they allowed the bombs to be plant, planted in the COVID, allowed the bombs to be planted in the vaccine, allowed the bombs to be planted in the continuing and indefinite and endless emerging uh, bombs that are going to be set against us when we don't look inside our system and say, wait a minute, this was set up, this is set up to blow. They've wired this thing to blow up. We better defuse the bomb. We got to become MacGyvers, I guess. Maybe is that the title? I don't know. Did the United States government just set us up for a takedown? is Title 50, folks. What can I tell you? Of course it can. And we have a, a pharmaceutical lobbyist sitting in the seat, seat of a, one seat of decision. They have admissions that they've made. We have CDC not being the appropriate medical authority that is professed in rules of the state. Divorcing your local power or giving them plausible good faith reliance that they don't have to make it. All of these things have added up to the destruction that you're watching, the disasters that the government ha governors have been allowed to perpetrate upon you all. And, in a, you know, when I said that, there's what, the South Dakota governor who seems to be not doing it? Well, she hasn't denounced it either, so I'm not too, too happy about seeing that. She has all the power to out it like President Trump could, saying, well, we haven't found an infectious agent. We can't. She could out the whole thing across the country, and she hasn't. No, she'd rather politicize it and say, come to, grow, come to live in South Dakota, a great place to live where we can go hunting and kill pheasants, and not, not to diminish that, you could, there's a conservation reason for why you do that, but at any rate, and so this is how we social distance. Okay, cute, but it's not denouncing the fraud. It's not denouncing the weapon of COVID with the car, the, the car without the fuel. 
and that there is no police power to even have a say. I hope you really get this. They don't have the power to have a say. Does that, that, that trigger anybody to think, wait a minute, yeah, that's right. And then you, or you say, oh, that's right, but you don't think you can do anything about it? That's where they want you to be. They want you to be that you're not going to say anything. No, it's too confusing. Oh, it's too much. Well, there's too much to do. Any excuse. that they, they will use any one of your excuses that you're silent and not fulfilling what you need to do to harm you. And I don't know what to say about that. That's the way it works. I have no condition to say or impose upon that reality. I have no way to contribute to that or pull back. It's what it is. And I've been here, here years, 10 years, 11, whatever it's been, stating to you how to counter that with examples of what I do in real life, not this inverted stuff. When government comes after you, you respond in certain and particular ways. It ways. If you don't, you become the, the poster children. Like for minors, when they didn't do what I was doing, what I was saying to do, they became the poster child and they suffered uh, jail time or parole or convictions or whatever, just for mining like everybody else was, but who didn't get caught. They didn't do that to to our mining claim. They didn't do that to me. Now, they could. They could become the people that dishonor the laws and the grants for hundred or so years. And I won't live that long if they do that to prevail like the native Indians. But there's a certain point when you have to stand up and defend yourself. And I, again, I'm going to say it again and again and again. COVID offers the opportunity to do that in every aspect of the oppression that we are suffering today. Relative to the political, might I say, religious promotions. Because remember, sustainable development ties to a religion. They want to impose, you have the freedom of exercising a religion or none at all. No, they're going to impose the green religion on you. They want to, you want to worry about your person status and all you say you're a man? No, they're imposing right now that you are a human. From the humanist's doctrine, another religion, a philosophy. And so the lack of your statement is the ability for them to put these other philosophies and other religions on you notwithstanding what the black and white would say, that the courts claim they're there to protect in you, if you only would. And so false flags came up. I found that interesting, uh, Grimner talking about it. Also, when reading, listening to number seven, Israel planning bombs, it sounded just like 9-11. Not bashful to do that in another country. And the dancing Israelis, and I told you this whole thing starts there, and 2020 would be on Operation Hindsight 2020, where they would... Not they, the Israelis, the whomever is running this thing, is going to lock it down even tighter through a medical imperative. And then I told you that look in the law, the black and white is the only way that you can protect yourself against that. Has been what I've been instructing all this time, and it continues to be what I have to instruct for those that are willing to stand up for yourself, take responsibility to protect yourself, have at least a little bit of belief in yourself, a little bit of value in yourself, and not hand you what you your excuses over for intervention, is that you let them have their way with you because you can't be bothered, because it's too tough. And anyway, I guess we'll stop and move further on. And uh, this now gets us back what one of the functions that I want to move into this is always the financial destruction, a financial economic hit, an economical attack, notwithstanding it also has an, a social attack. It's the three pillars attack, but we don't really function of, of face too much, at least uh, in our discussion. You can tease out pretty much anything. But uh, we found it interesting here, again, to be careful in the future as they drive us into trying to figure out where we're going to run to stay away from this thing. Uh, this is how the herding, uh, if you want to be a hard part of the herd, you think you're independent. But no, you're being herded in a different way. Electronic Foundation, uh, Frontier Foundation, calls out Coinbase on privacy. Uh, this is a little report here that says that Coinbase was shown to, in the way the dynamic works, is shown to be a private company that actually has possession of your information. 
that actually is the one that controls the information you have when you deal with companies through any of these electronic devices. Uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals ruled this year that found that cryptocurrency users sacrifice some privacy when using an exchange. And so this is like, the, they want to talk about cryptocurrency being decentralized and all, but it's not. And you're not in control of your own information. You're not in control to some private interest, some third-party interest that then can be tapped by the government to take away or inquire into at least what they want. Now, when you think about when the government uses such rules as susceptible to be that you haven't proven you're immune, then you're going to be subject. And this whole thing works that way. That's why people can't quite get a handle on it. It's why you think, you, well, you don't. You, you don't have the presumption of innocence. It's already working through the proportionality provision for sustainable development and that your rights are always subject to the community, the, communi the communal condition, which is ruled by a bureau rat. You don't have the law of the land there. You can't get the law of the land there. In fact, it is made so that you don't have property. If you don't have property, they don't have to give you due process. The fact that they're avoiding due process in the COVID shows you they don't have view you having no rights, no property that they're even violating. It is really one of the first violations on its face. So, so I just wanted to, again pointing out, be careful on any reliance on what's coming in the future as they force and herd you into things that you think you're being that you're getting away you're being different from. It's not. It's really a very tactful, very strategically applied pressure that gets you to move where they want you to move for those that will move at all. Instead of having you create, find the foundation and start fighting from there, which they can't actually touch. Turning your uh, phone on qualifies as searching. Which is an interesting thing. Uh, this is old. Now, I'm finally getting to some stuff from months ago. You have some protection, but it, it's not with the information that you've given over to some third party, in particular with what you think is a decentralized exchange for value. All that information, that whatever you're giving them and the, whatever they can derive from that is handed over to a third party who can be whose arm can be twisted even if they want to fight. But turning on your phone qualifies for searching when it was done by officials in the government. And I wanted you to hear about this, because if you don't know about that, you may not know to state certain things. When this starts to come down, like you heard, in Australia, in Melbourne, they stole the phone. Now, this is a different state. The laws should be pretty simple, similar, and that you need to have this awareness that these things are going to have to be coming in your defense as they try to extract from you the information they need to keep you servient. To me, it's not much different than the mask, in a way, as a control device that people, real, some realize it, not other, not, not many actually do, but that we need to be cognizant of are the tools that they use, that is being used against us, that if we allow a little bit, just a little bit, it allows the leverage, the, the a power to be instilled in the official. And the statement that they don't have a right does have no has no power, has absolutely zero power. Remember that as you don't act, don't get administrative review started, and let these people take you down on an illusion. Thank you, Griffin, for what you do at RealLibertyMedia.com, and all you do to help us be around, pick the archive, and give everybody access. UCY.TV. Thank you, Jules, and what you do allow us to be a ghost in the machine. A couple of the ghosts, I understand with the Sholly and uh, Sound Minds and Normalization of Ignorance Minds, Bit Shoot thank you for what you all do there and listening I'll be with you next week, Tech Diffs or Nature Willing Well that's another lesson I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave from behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast. This is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
But that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. 